scheduled to visit the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, thank you all for attending this meeting of the Oregon Community Services District. Coming out of closed session, there was nothing to report other than uh, council given to, or uh, council given to, or direction given to district council. Let's see. Moving on to item D, agenda. If there's any changes to the agenda or any suggestions any board members have, is there anything that anyone would like to bring up? I move to adopt the agenda. Um, second. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to item E, recognition. Uh, at this time, the district and the board of directors would like to recognize a local citizen for their contributions to the district. Uh, yeah, real quick, I don't know if anyone knows, but the district took receipt of a new fire engine um, most recently, and we wanted to take a minute just to recognize someone who helped make that happen. Um, the, the district had a real need to, to make this capital purchase, and unfortunately it came at a time where maybe finances weren't it's, uh, abundant for the district, but uh, one of our longtime commissioners who, over the years, has always bragged, for those of you from CSA 13, has bragged about how wealthy you were and how much money you had. Well, Commissioner Marinoff brought up the idea of, hey, maybe CSA 13 could put up their portion of the fire, of the fire engine um, up front, which was very helpful to the district for a lot of reasons. One is it was a substantial amount of money. I think it was $186,000. And it allowed the Marinwood district to uh, postpone their contribution for an additional year or so. We want to take this moment to thank Ron for that. It was very, very needed and very forthcoming. And then we started thinking about all the things Ron had been around and done over the years. So I went through it in my mind. Ron started as a volunteer firefighter in 1965, three years before I was born. <laughs> and, uh, he was a volunteer firefighter from 1965 to 1977, at which point he retired from the fire service, but he moved right in to become a fire commissioner. So. Um, he's been a CSA 13 fire commissioner, your representative, since 1977 until and the space is blank because he's still a commissioner and we plan to keep using him while he would like to be a part of it. So um, he's done a great job representing your interests. Uh, when I first started here as the fire chief, Ron was the person who was opposed to everything. Ron didn't want to spend a dot. And I was like, what's wrong with this guy? Why doesn't he want to help us out? And I kind of took it as a personal challenge then. I said, you know what? If I can get Ron Maranoff to agree to something, to a need that the fire department has, the rest of these people would be easy. So I embraced it and I said, you know, I'm going to work, work with Ron. And as soon as I, I took that upon, um, he's been an ally to me and he's been very helpful. So thank you for that, Ron. Uh, so we have a plaque we're going to give to him. Ron Maranoff, volunteer firefighter from 1965 to 1977. CSA fire commissioner, 1977 to blank. In appreciation for all your hard work, especially the purchase of the new fire engine. So thank you, Ron. And with that, we also have a nice picture of the new fire engine to give him. And the board and the uh, fire commission has also written a nice letter, which I think Jeff would like to read. So thank you very much for all your help over the years. Three generations here tonight of volunteer firefighters from the Marinoff family. My son, David Marinoff, was a volunteer firefighter here. His brother, Alan Marinoff, was a volunteer here. And uh, my grandson, Thomas Marinoff, is a current volunteer with Marinwood. So <clears throat> you're never going to get rid of the Marinoff. So it's not hard to try. But uh, the chief has fallen down on one thing because I looked at the new engine and there's no plaque with my name on it. <laughs> it's on order. <laughs> We're going to have your picture. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to 
read this into the record as well. <clears throat> For those of us who know him, one of the first words that leaps to mind when we think about Ron Marinoff is involved. Since 1963, Ron has led or participated in grassroots efforts such as formation of the Zoning and Planning Committee in Lucas Valley, helped establish County Service Area 13 to provide fire protection to Upper Lucas Valley, and served as president of the Lucas Valley Homeowners Association. Ron's been involved <coughs> in efforts as diverse as securing and maintaining our valley's open space, lobbying the Coastal Commission to prevent Lucas Valley Road from becoming a four-lane highway, to Point Reyes and helping to ensure more thoughtful, less concentrated development of the ranch lands to the west of Upper Lucas Valley. Ron has been a key player in defining the character of Lucas Valley today. Meanwhile, Ron was one of the original volunteer firefighters in Marinwood and served from 1965 to 1977. When he relinquished his firefighting duties to others, Ron immediately joined the Marinwood Fire Commission served a chairperson, and still actively participates to this day. <clears throat> that he maintains his connections and keeps involved with the county, the city of San Rafael, and LAFCO continues to bring valuable context to our community through his service on the commission and his attendance at board meetings. As a member of the fire commission, Ron has been a tireless advocate for financial responsibility and has made numerous valuable suggestions for Marinwood. It is in this area where Ron once again demonstrated his vision and determination to do something of value for our community. When Marinwood faced, was faced with replacing its 20-year-old Type 1 fire engine <clears throat> in the midst of difficult financial times, Ron suggested and gained approval from CSA 13 to pay their entire share of the lease for a new engine in the first year, thus allowing Marinwood the flexibility to purchase the engine within budgetary constraints. Without Ron's insightful and thoughtful gesture, this critical purchase might have been put off for several years. Our entire community, Marinwood, Upper Lucas Valley, Lucas Valley Estates, and those areas of San Rafael to whom Marinwood provides fire and emergency services owe Ron a debt of gratitude. Those of us who have and will continue to work directly with him will benefit from his leadership, stewardship, and example. Thank you, Ron, for all you do. Ron is on our finance committee and uh, is our advocate for CS13. And we are very grateful for Ron's continued contribution to not only our community of Lucas Valley, but also our entire valley. So on behalf of the Lucas Valley Homeowners Association, thank you, Ron, for keeping us on task. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say a, a very few words. Uh, first, uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And I've lived up in Upper Lucas Valley since 1963. And in 1972, the county was drawing up its first countywide plan. And in that countywide plan was a four lane highway from 101 through Lucas Valley to Point Reyes with billboards up and down 101 saying, the fastest way to Point Reyes National Seashore, take Lucas Valley Road. We got that thrown out. There was also a ridge top highway proposed from between Whites Hill and San Anselmo across all the ridges, and it was to come down to Lucas Valley Road at Mount Lassen. And we got that eliminated. Also, later on, the Renaissance Fair decided they wanted to move to the Grady Ranch which would have resulted in 10,000 cars over six weekends, 10,000 cars each weekend for six weeks when the Renaissance Fair, <coughs> we wouldn't be able to get out of our houses to get on Lucas Valley Road with 10,000 cars. And we finally took care of that. So when I say eternal vigilance, it's important because there's always people who look at a map and think Lucas Valley would be appropriate for something. So let's keep our eye on the ball and have really good communication with our supervisor. 
because uh, we, we need an advocate. And also to work very hard to see that LAFCO doesn't do anything dreadful to us here. And I've had long conversations with the LAFCO director about that. The slogan now in Lucas Valley, in Upper Lucas Valley anyway, uh, to laugh go is leave us alone. <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words and uh, the plaques and everything. It's a total surprise to me. Uh, I was really puzzled when I saw the board of directors from our homeless association here. I said, did you guys make a wrong turn somewhere? <laughs> but this is a great evening and I was so uh, pleased that my son and grandson are here also. Thank you again. Unless there's any any other words from anyone uh, re re regarding Ron, then we can go ahead and move forward. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank, thank, thank you all. Thanks, guys. Mr. Naylor just read be posted on our website somewhere. Or could I it be? Don't see why why not. I would assume it can. I, mean, I read it into the record, right? Yes, yeah. you did. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Yes. Yes. Because that's fabulous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to item F, LAFCO Municipal Service Review Study. Uh, presentation from LAFCO Executive Officer Keen Simons to discuss upcoming municipal service review. Study of San Rafael, Lucas Valley area. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank well, you. thank you so much, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Akai, and, and board members, staff, and uh, members of the audience. Uh, Keen Simons, uh, now the two year plus executive officer for Murray County's local agency formation commission. And I'm very pleased uh, to bring with me our relatively new analyst, uh, Rachel Jones, who all of you are going to get to know a little better. Uh, in, in the next few months, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, LAFCO, uh, just a, a quick little uh, a bit of context. Uh, there's one of us in every county in California, and we are the uh, state's uh, regional service planning arm. And what we do is we uh, both regulate um, the physical establishment of cities and special districts like Marinwood, uh, CSD, uh, that involves any time there's a formation request, uh, an expansion, or something of that nature where a physical boundary line is being proposed to be moved. And then there's this regular or a planning feature that LAFCOs take up, and one of the reasons I think we're here uh, this evening. And in short, um, it's this requirement that came uh, about, oh, I would say about 10 years, or no, more than that, about 15 years ago now, that LAFCOs across the state every five years or so start preparing studies. We call them municipal service reviews. And at the heart, these are documents that are supposed to be these third party kind of independent check-ins on um, the adequacy, the availability, and performance of local governmental services, all as it relates to current and future community needs. And so with that as kind of some context, you may recall, and I know Justin was here, uh, um, about two years ago, when I first came uh, to Mern Lafco, I, I introduced myself at one of these meetings and I said, uh, Our commission, which includes a number of uh, appointed elected officials, is starting to develop a study schedule to kind of telegraph our resources going forward with respect to this mandate. Again, this mandate to prepare these service reviews. And at the time, I uh, noted that we had this draft study schedule uh, in place and kind of identified. Uh, coming back and looking at San Rafael and the, the Lucas Valley, Marinewood area uh, sometime in the near future. Well, um, time has passed. It's now two years later. In fact, we did adopt that study schedule, and we have on the books for this fiscal year uh, a study of 
uh, what we call the kind of the, the, the North Central 101 area, and that includes uh, the great uh, Special District of Marinwood, as well as uh, your neighbors uh, uh, to the, uh, let's see here, the west and south of you, uh, CSA 13, uh, with Mr. Marinoff and crew, and then, of course, uh, City of San Rafael. And at its heart, again, this is a study that has no pre uh, presumptions. It is a, um, an independent assessment of what are the services that are being provided by all of the governmental agencies. And I think in total, and I'll look to Rachel, I think we're going to be looking at at least six governmental agencies, mm -hmm. uh, half of them being dependent, half of them being independent. And ultimately, we need to come up with a set of determinations uh, that are prescribed under government code. And I'd certainly be happy to get into uh, the details of that. But what I wanted to make sure that this board was aware of as we uh, start uh, putting pen to paper relatively soon, and I'll come back to that comment in a second, is that there are a handful of specific outcomes that this study uh, will ultimately, um, or at least potentially, lead to. Uh, for one, and this is by way of uh, the state uh, state law, we are going to be doing uh, what we call sphere of influence updates uh, for all of the affected agencies. So, for example, when we look at the Marinwood Community Service District sphere of influence, which is a boundary line that laugh goes and laugh goes alone, draw and then update every so often, and is the gatekeeper uh, to any future boundary changes or outside services. Um, we're going to look at your sphere of influence and we're going to consider, are there any reasonable changes that we think uh, should be in play to accommodate potential changes over the next five to ten years? And then in addition to that comment, we're going to look at maybe even some specific boundary changes, whether they be areas we think you should be considering enhancing or areas that maybe for different reasons you should think about uh, detaching. And then also, at the end of the process, um, and again, this is perhaps the most, um, not debated, that's not the right word, but the most uh, potentially long-term significant impact of a municipal service review is that the state requires that we uh, weigh into the issue of governance and alternative governance uh, um, opportunities. And that can come in the form of LAFCA weighing in on whether uh, there's an opportunity for reorganizations or if there are certain services that we think should be provided in a particular area, uh, in an area that, are, that aren't being provided uh, currently. And so a good example uh, for this uh, district is um, latent powers. Okay, so all special districts have latent powers. And these are the uh, items that under your enabling legislation, and so you're, you, you uh, operate under Community Services District Law. And under that section of law, there's about 20 or so specific service powers that you could theoretically provide, okay? And they run the gamut uh, from everything that you already do, uh, fire protection, uh, to things such as mosquito abatement, uh, police protection, uh, and uh, possibly even funding uh, advisory or uh, um, other types of councils uh, such as an area planning uh, commission, okay? Now, these are things that I know that in, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe warrant additional review as we go forward. Uh, and certainly, one of the things I want to get on this board's uh, uh, radar is uh, this upcoming Thursday, uh, Rachel is going to our commission at 7 o'clock uh, at San Rafael City Hall and is going to be seeking formal approval of a scope of analysis that uh, we've drafted and been working on for the last uh, month or so. And if we get the green light, um, Rachel's going to hit the, run, uh, hit the ground run, uh, running and start working on this report, the Municipal Service Review. And it would be safe to say that probably within the next few months, working with your staff, uh, we'll generate an agency profile, and we'll start tackling issues like our own population and, and growth projections for <coughs> the community, our own take on infrastructure needs or deficiencies, and again, those, uh, those areas that I already uh, mentioned, if there are any areas of governance alternatives that we think make sense, and they don't necessarily have to be 
formal consolidations or reorganizations. They could be even functional activities like joint power authorities. Um, but we also will tackle the topic of maybe uh, related powers as well. This is an opportunity for this board and certainly your community uh, to start providing us some active uh, feedback as we go through what I would suggest is probably a six to nine month uh, process that if we play our cards right, hopefully we'll have a complete draft report out, uh, what do we uh, say, by uh, November. By November. Uh, and one of the things we'd like to do is, if, uh, especially if this uh, board is willing, to maybe even make use of one of your rooms and have uh, myself and Rachel kind of do a community workshop to explain the report and in particular some of the recommendations and findings that we may have. Now that all said, uh, nothing is going to be produced uh, that your general manager won't see beforehand, so at least there will be an opportunity uh, for us to get some internal feedback, uh, whether it's uh, disagreements about some data that we've collected and we've interpreted, or uh, to help us better understand, you know, we may be missing perhaps, you know, a key local condition that influences why you do uh, uh, service provision a certain way or why you don't do service provision a certain way. So that, the dialogue that we're going to have with your staff is certainly uh, going to be key. Uh, and it will be through your staff. Um, you know, for the most part, we'll be happy to come and, and provide formal presentations to the board. Uh, but until we get a draft document, we'll be really relying on, on staff, not only Marinwood, but San Rafael uh, in the county who represents uh, CSA uh, 13. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pause here. Certainly be happy to, to go into any more detail as, as you see uh, fit. But my, my goal, hopefully, was just to remind you that uh, we're going to be doing the study, that it has certain outcomes tied to it, but the outcomes um, are, are based on addressing state factors. And there's no predetermination uh, on, on our end about whether uh, reorganization is appropriate, whether a sphere of influence amendment is appropriate, whether the relationship between CSA 13 and Marin, which should stay the same. In many ways, the way I at least kind of view LAFCA law, this is really first and foremost about making sense of the baseline. Uh, and perhaps even justifying the baseline. It's very possible we can come away here and we say, you know, relative to everything we understand to be uh, true, these are the best setups that uh, we see right now. Or we may say, you know what, uh, we see a couple of issues. Uh, we'd like you to consider uh, them board, and when we come back in five years, we want to talk about it. Or, it's always possible we may be more proactive than that and say, we found some issues. We think you should uh, uh, give us some feedback, and we'd like to have at least some kind of uh, immediate follow-up uh, uh, with the affected community and with the boards. So I'm going to pause here and defer to uh, uh, the board for any questions or whatever I can do to help. Great. Thank you very much, Dean. Before before we open it to public comment or questions, I do want to see: Are there any questions from the board for? For Keen or for LAFCO that any of us have? It seems pretty straightforward to what's going to happen as long as we get to watch <laughs> or interact. <laughs> um, yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, certainly, as we get on the road, there'll be more questions, but um, you've at least given us an idea of what's number one, what the timeline is going to be, and um, over time, we'll figure out how to get involved. Great. But thank you. Um, in your presentation to the uh, City of San Rafael, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned three areas uh, that you will be examining. Um, one of them was public safety, but um, also public works and community development. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, public safety is one of our um, areas of uh, uh, service provision. But I don't really see how the uh, parks and recreation uh, fit into the picture. Does that mean that your analysis will be focused on just part of uh, our services? Uh, not at all. So, um, and again, with the premise that it's a regional study that I think uh, you know takes in 30 some odd square miles, or maybe it's too big. Um, but again, you have the city of San Rafael. You have a handful of dependent CSAs, apart from number 13, 
uh, that serve uh, places like Los Ranchitos, um, uh, yes, uh, San Rafael Sanitation in San the Benicia. country club area, San Benicia. What, what, what Rachel ultimately came up with, and I think it's a, it's a good um, kind of strategy is um, create these three broad categories, as you mentioned, community development, public works, uh, and public safety that to some degree all of these agency services touch upon. And so public works in our uh, kind of orientation includes parks and recreation services. Oh, so it's not necessarily what... what these are kind of broader categories that were, yeah. Okay. Um, in many ways, this is somewhat trying to, you know, take a rather broad directive and try to fit into local conditions. So it's not the perfect fit, um, but I think uh, for our purposes, uh, we'll get there. It just may be under a category. It, it, it might be a very tricky comparison if you compare like apples to oranges in a way. If you sure. Know what I mean. Sure. Keen, I had uh, two questions for you. One in regards to. <coughs> In regards to if, if we as a district wanted to wanted to activate any latent powers, when would you when would it be best for you to have that type of direction from from us as a district? So uh, certainly the district could signal, you know, as early as tonight there is interest in X, Y, and Z. However, under state law, um, even if you were a hundred percent committed to for example, activating police protection as one of your latent powers. LAFCA would say, thank you so much for the application, but however, until we get done with the municipal service review, uh, we can't act on it. So um, I would suggest, while providing us you know, in advance signaling of your interest and what you hope to get out of the study, because all agencies can utilize the study for their own benefit of, of tackling a topic that may be per, uh, pertinent to uh, local needs, um, we're looking at probably, again, if November is the, the goal of kind of getting this to our commission, probably waiting until then. Um, part of the latent power uh, discussion, of course, uh, and this is specific to the enabling legislation, um, has to be paired with a definitive um, service plan in terms of finances. And that's unlike annexations. For example, if you were so desirable uh, uh, or desired to annex all of Silvera and all of uh, the, the church property up there, LAFCA would have to consider a number of factors. But under state law, it doesn't require that we make specific financial uh, findings. Um, for good or for bad, anytime you do a latent uh, power activation, we actually have to do a little more uh, uh, work on the financial uh, aspect and make a specific finding. So a little more work goes into it. Okay, so but it, so it's something that would be most appropriate after after. Yeah, in terms of an application, it would yeah. need to wait to the MSR. But in terms of at least signaling, hey, we're interested in this, or we're you know cu curious about that. Um, I would suggest the sooner the district you know provides us. Uh, you know, some formal communication to that, we then can justify on our end expending some resources to look at a particular topic. So, before before the board would, would do anything, there would obviously be, uh, I, I would imagine, extensive discussion regarding anything in that amount, but just wanting to understand the, the timeline in that regard. And, um, um, and beyond that, in terms of Activating lane power is 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 there a um, rough um, rough ballpark figure that that generally comes out to, or is it just dependent upon what essentially is needing to be done? So somewhat of a, a, an answer to both. So our fee schedule uh, contemplates processing latent power requests on a deposit basis, based on you know the executive officer's kind of best guess of the number of staff hours it would take uh, to perform that. Um, I think uh, you know the, a reasonable guess of any latent power is at least you know 30 hours to upwards to 100 hours, depending on how complex, uh, and also if there is a, an additional uh, environmental factor that uh, consideration that goes into it. Uh, we're still a very good rate relative to uh, governmental agencies. Our hourly, hourly rate is only $126. That may change though uh, by December, so keep that in mind. But that's how we would base the deposit. We okay. say, okay, we think. 
going to take you know 40 hours, 40 times 126, and then we work against that deposit. Okay. Thank you. I get the wage goes up January 1st. So. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Then I'll go ahead and open it up to comments or questions from the public. John? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, are there any members on your board who are members of the San Rafael City Council? Uh, there is. Uh, so, and I thank you, I, I apologize for not uh, outlining who our membership is as of today. So, of our three city council uh, members, we have Gary Phillips, Mayor of San Rafael, uh, Carla Condon, uh, Mayor of Corte Madera, and then Herb Weiner, uh, uh, Mayor of Sausalito. Our three supervisors, uh, Damon Connolly from this district, uh, Kate Sears, and then Judy Arnold. And then our three special district members include uh, Craig Murray from nearby Las Salinas, uh, Jack Baker from North Marin Water, and then uh, uh, Lou uh, Caius uh, from, um, thank you, Rachel, uh, <laughs> from, um, Come on, now, you're supposed to I know, and the camera's right there. Uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, Alto, Alto uh, 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 District. And then those nine get together, and they appoint uh, two members of the general public, uh, one being our longtime chairman, Jeffrey Blanchfield, and then uh, uh, Christopher Burke out of Inverness. Did that answer your question, Ron? Uh, yes, I just wanted to a brief comment. Uh, lately, the uh, relationship between uh, Marinwood Lucas Valley and the city of San Rafael has improved with the new mayor, a new business manager, a new fire chief, and a new uh, police chief because in years past, San Rafael uh, espoused the policy of manifest destiny. I don't know if you remember that from U.S. history. We had to go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. They vowed San Rafael should go all the way to the southern borders of Novato. And they had a very uh, aggressive program trying to get us to annex to them. And as I say, luckily, uh, the philosophy has changed now to one uh, more cooperation. So if uh, the idea of manifest destiny raises its ugly head in the one of your meetings, I wish you would please have them disavow that publicly. I will file that away. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Stephen. Uh, actually, I have a couple of questions. So first of all, in your presentation, uh, I, I just want to understand your role. You talk about looking at things and changing things around. What I'm not hearing is any vote of the people or any vote of the board. Is that the way it works? You basically say, we've looked at this, this is our recommendation, this is what we're going to do, or is there some uh, involvement by the public? So. Yes and yes. When it comes to determining the sphere of influence, which again is the state's version of an urban growth boundary line for a city or a special district, uh, the vote and the power to make that designation lies solely uh, with the commission. So there would be no vote uh, of uh, other districts, other cities, or registered voters. Okay. Now when it comes to actual boundary changes, whether that be in the means of a fundamental reorganization like taking, and this is just an example, Ron, but taking CSA 13 and consolidating it with uh, Marine with CSD, that would be dependent on uh, a vote of the people. Um, and there's, a, you know, LAFCO has kind of a, um, a layered approach to protest proceedings that takes into account both landowner uh, and registered voters, assuming there's a distinction. Um, but yes, so ultimately, uh, voters would decide, um, and the same with um, if there was any just annexation. You know, uh, I made that example, good or bad, of if Marin would want to annex the Silvera land. Um, if the property owners are in full agreement, well, then there's no vote of the people. If all 100% of the property owners are on board with an annexation. However, if 
one property owner has not, you know, signed a consent form, there is this process, a uh, protest proceeding where you give everyone an opportunity to come in and if uh, there's a sufficient um, numbers to say the majority are okay with it, we don't hold an election, we just go ahead and prove it, or if enough people uh, uh, protest it, well then we go through a process of actually holding a mail ballot election. Okay, uh, so a, a couple other things, and this is to Ron's earlier points about uh, San Rafael. Uh, San Rafael has terrible debt. They also look at Lucas Valley as a place to, say, put the Ritter Center or other projects that they have. And so um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think how this works out. I mean, you know, we're not in great shape, but we're, we don't want to marry a bankrupt, and, and uh, how do those sorts of things get sorted out? Well, so again, going back to if a, if a fundamental boundary change or reorganization is proposed, um, there are layers of, A, thresholds for LAFCA to make the determination that it makes sense for a marriage uh, to occur. And then if LAFCO goes through the process of deciding, yes, this marriage has merit, again, unless every single landowner and or registered voter were to have signed a consent form, there would be this opportunity for protest. And at that, on that, at, at that point, it's basically the majority decides. If the majority don't want that marriage to happen, it doesn't go any further. If a majority are agreeable, well, then that marriage uh, occurs. And perhaps just for the benefit of, of, of an example. So before me and Rachel came to Marin Lafco, again, I came here two and a half years ago, Rachel, uh, just six months ago, uh, our predecessors were working on a study in Southern Marin that ultimately concluded, geez, there's these four independent uh, sewer uh, districts. Sanitary districts. Sanitary districts, thank you. And through the prism of Lafco, and again, the, the planning laws that we administer on behalf of the state, it certainly made sense to the commission and staff that a marriage occurred, that these four districts turn into one. And we thought uh, it was a great idea, and the commission ultimately approved it. Um, but going to this comment, uh, there was enough people to uh, protest to trigger an election, and that election occurred in all four of the jurisdictional boundaries, and we needed passage in all four. So even if three of the four said yes, if one of those four uh, jurisdictional uh, uh, boundaries or, or service areas said no, uh, it wouldn't happen. And in that case, all four came back to varying degrees saying thanks, but no thanks left, but we like our, our four independent sewer collection agencies that uh, simply uh, rely on SASM for treatment. And that will be actually a topic we'll come back to in a few years as well. Keith, I attended one of your recent meetings and you said a stat that is stuck with me and I don't remember the numbers, I'm wondering if you could just repeat it, that there are X number of uh, government agencies in Marin County and that ranked uh, a certain number amongst the nine Bay Area counties. Yeah, so uh, uh, there are currently 11 cities and 54 special districts in Marin County. And those 54 special districts are divided between 30 independent districts, and this is an independent special district, and then the CSAs, and then the dependent. So those 64 uh, uh, governmental agencies subject to LAFCO uh, rank only second to uh, Contra Costa in terms of the amount of local government. Contra Costa has uh, 67. And I'll take that point, you know, the, you know, kind of extract that point even further. Uh, Marin really likes its local government, and so there's one unit of local government for every, I think, uh, 4,200 residents in Marin. And I count that by special district and city. In Los Angeles County, uh, there is one unit of the same type of government for every 850,000 uh, uh, citizens. So. While uh, you know, there's a perception that perhaps Southern California uh, is a little more bureaucratic and it has uh, you know, more layers of government, in truth, uh, Marin has a little more. And so that's one of the things that we look at. And again, not to presuppose that there are marriages that we need to make, but it suggests that at least it's something that we should have on our radar as we go through these uh, uh, planning processes. 
I just ask one other question concerning the voting. Uh, is it, are these ordinary elections, three months, or is it like a, a, a vote, you have to vote within 30 days or collect signatures within 30 days to protest the, uh, the marriage, if you will? So, so uh, the protest proceeding itself is generally needs to occur within 60 days of the LAFCO action. And then within that, and it can't occur before 21 days, so there's this 21 to 60 day window that we have to allow for protests. And if that protest is successful, and again, if there's, a, there's a calculation to it, uh, then we call the elections department uh, and we say we need to uh, 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 hold an election for X, Y, or Z. And I believe, and I'm not you know, sure about this, but I believe they're committed to doing it within uh, three months. Um, or if there is, I think there's some qualification, if a general June or November election is within a certain time period, they can place it on that. But most LAFCO matters go on mail ballots uh, elections just because of, of the scope. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the public? Yeah, I have one other one. In the subject of election, if there's a protest, does it have to come from the annexe or the can the annexor, a resident of the annexing entity, file a protest? Or can a protest only be made from the entity that they want to annex? So and that's, that's an interesting question. So you're reversing the, 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 the field of, of normal orientation. If Marinwood wanted to uh, uh, annex, Marinwood District wanted to let me say this differently. If Silvera wanted to annex to you, um, is there an ability for property owners and residents within Marinewood CSD to say no to that? Um, no, not under just an annexation. You now, if there was some type of fundamental reorganization where we're going back to the CSA 13 Marinewood, if that marriage were to be proposed, yes, both residents and, uh, and landowners of both governmental agencies' boundaries would get to protest. Um, but the idea uh, under state law for an annexation is, um, generally speaking, the district or the service entity, whether it be the city or the, the special district, could protest and say, you know, hey, it's great, LAFCA, you received this request from property owner X to annex us, but we want nothing, you know, we can't do it, we're not interested. You could protest and essentially stop the proceedings. But an individual landowner within or resident within your jurisdictional boundary under state law doesn't have the ability to stop it. They could go to you and petition you to you know, stop it. Does a, a territory has to be, do you have to declare a sphere of influence for an area before it can be annexed or consolidated? Yes, yes so again, the sphere of influence is the boundary keeper. So. Uh, in order for any land to ever be proposed for annexation or even an outside service agreement, um, it needs to be within the sphere uh, with some very arcane exceptions that I don't see ever really applying uh, for this district. So again, you know, uh, we're going to go uh, this Thursday to our commission with this draft scope of analysis. Uh, I assume the commission will approve something, whether it's exactly what Rachel prepared or maybe some modifications therein. And then that's going to start this uh, clock on our end where we're going to send out uh, some information requests uh, to Eric and to his counterparts with the city and with the CSAs. And I think ideally we would develop a kind of a draft profile of the agency. Um, within the next uh, uh, few months and, and really work with Eric in, in kind of organizing how he would like us to go about um, you know, presenting uh, uh, you know, specific sections, whether it be uh, on fire, uh, parks, uh, or other topics. So again, you'll see more of us, and uh, again, thank you for uh, the opportunity uh, this evening. Uh, just before we close, Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly say, my name is Chris Calloway. I'm here, uh, aide for Supervisor Connolly. Um, just wanted to say that, obviously, Dan's engaged in this process, just like the rest of you guys. Uh, we met with uh, Keenan and Rachel, along with the rest of the county agencies when they came to the county. Um, if you guys have any questions for Damon or want to speak with him, um, I'm uh, the person assigned, the staff member, the aide assigned to this one. 
So uh, feel free to reach out to me. My contact info is on the website if you don't already have it. Most of you probably do. Um, but yeah, we'll be sitting along uh, with you guys and, and participating in this, prog uh, in this process as a partner. So. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Great. And unless there's anything else from you, Keith, then uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you, Keith. <laughs> Moving on to item G, consent calendar. So, uh, there's any changes to the draft minutes for bills paid or questions about bills paid by the board? We have three pay periods. Just, uh, well, payday is the first, so mm -hmm. it, it Technically, we're first. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, do we still have a handle on the overtime? Because I know two were high, one was, I guess, it, back it's, to normal. Um, the short answer is yes, we do. Is that I know that we have to have three people in on duty every day. So, if we need to hire overtime, we have to have overtime. That's the way it works. Unfortunately, we have two work-related injuries, one non-work-related injuries, and one birth of a child. So uh, two of those four are coming back in the very near future. The child have a, is on the engine? No, no. Uh, Brandon Salvatella uh, took some time off because he had the birth of his second son, Nico, about three weeks ago, I would say. He's coming back to work on Friday, though. I talked to him yesterday. He's very anxious to get back to work. If you I can imagine that. that. Yeah. I, can, I can imagine that. Is the child paramedic certified? And when does he start? Yeah. So, so um, I have a question, Mr. President. Um, should we um, review the uh, minutes from the past meeting and decide to accept them or to change them prior to moving on to the uh, payment schedule? Uh, so, Understanding, so we, we're currently in consent calendar, and I know previously we've generally uh, approved consent calendar altogether. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about the minutes? Uh, I, I have an addition that I would like okay. added to the minutes. Sure. Um, under district matters, um, regarding the board bylaws, and I can I can email you what, great. what I'd like to add, but I'll just you say, can say it. You yeah, so I'll say your company. Um, in the second paragraph, update from ad hoc committee review revised pre policies. Um, where, in my comments, where Kai suggested that board members and commission members should be granted free access to the pool facilities, considering that the facility is under their purview, I would just like to add to that in order to encourage board and commissioner participation to make the best informed decisions on the service for our residents. I'll send that to you. Okay. Are there any other changes to the minutes or comments for the minutes? No. No. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and are there anything? Is there anything further regarding bills paid? Yes. Yeah. Um, Thirty thousand in shared services. Is that due to the strike team? Um. This is strike. This is overtime for shared services. Yes, that was a strike team reimbursement. So that was basically money. We were reimbursed mm -hmm. for him being on our fire engine, and then we took that portion and reimbursed Santa Fe. Right, understood. Okay. Just out of curiosity, um, is there any, would it be easy or difficult to put the date of the payment on this report? Oh, I'm sorry, the date of the date when of I the payment. paid the bill? Yeah. Um, no, I can add that. It would help me because I'm sort of simple-minded. I like to see them the page. <laughs> I also, if you have, if you have a question beforehand, I have like copies of invoices sent between Sarah Phone Room with for shared services reimbursements, and I have a pretty good track record. I'm happy to share that with anyone who's interested. If it wouldn't be difficult, I think it would be. Um, I mean, I process bills literally every day, I'm, so I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the. Um, Gary, is it Gockel? Yes, Gary. Yeah, um, I thought we were done with him momentarily. Is that not true? Did we have more work last month as well? Um, no, it was a few months ago. He just billed us um, ah. recently. Oh, okay. All right. 
I know there are other matters to talk about. We'll talk about later. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board regarding Bill's date? I did have a question, the same one that Jeff had regarding that shared services. So, but um, it was it was it was money in, money out. Yep. So it wasn't any kind of a loss. Although we did receive a check for forty-three thousand dollars reimbursement from Santa Fe and Revenue. I'm not sure that's shown here, but uh, that was made about the same time. Great, thanks you. And, any, well, go ahead. No, I was going to say I'm just with the fire stuff. Are there any questions or comments on consent calendar from the public? Go ahead, Linda. Um, I was looking at bills paid this month and last month, and I didn't see anything about the sheriff that you requested for that one meeting mm -hmm. on the dog ordinance. And I was wondering if we had received a bill from the sheriff's department for that yet. We will not receive a bill from them for that service. I'm sorry? We will not we'll, we will not receive a bill from them for that service. Oh, it's free? Yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you. And for the record, that was not requested for that agenda item in particular. That's just when it happened to occur. Are there any other questions or comments regarding consent calendar from the public? Moving on, uh, all those in favor of approving consent calendar? I have to. Oh, sorry. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Move to approve. Second. Right, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those, any opposed? Uh, pass unanimously. Moving on to item H, public comment. Open time for items not on the agenda. Is there any comments from the public at this time? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Thank you. So, is it is okay? Go, go ahead, Stephen. Um, so, I'm uh, currently in process of putting all of the uh, all the tapes from the last couple of years of, of the meetings up on online so they can serve as a resource or not if you want but uh, there's some interesting stuff there so that's it Linda did you have a anything for opening I do I would have I would like to say that the Brown Act law supersedes Rosenberg's rules I don't know if you all knew that and Government Code Section 54954.3.A says, every agenda for regular meetings shall provide an opportunity for members of the public to directly address the legislative body on any item of interest to the public before or during the legislative body's consideration of the item that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body provided that no action shall be taken on any item not appearing on the agenda unless the action is otherwise authorized by subdivision B, blah, blah, blah. That's all. Thank you. Moving on to item I, personal matters. Change in administrative assistant position from part-time position to full-time position, including approval of job description and proposed compensation. Eric? Yeah, so what I have included in here is a uh, job description that I, position description that I put together, uh, kind of gone through, looked at others, looked at ones that I've put together in the past at previous places. Uh, I feel fairly good about it. Obviously, uh, you know, as I put in a disclaimer at the bottom, it's not an indication of every responsibility, uh, but I, I, I'm comfortable with this job description. I am comfortable uh, with the range, and I feel that it, uh, anything is probably on the low end of a competitive range, but I think it's, it's fair. Um, I would recommend moving this uh, position right smack to the middle of the range. I'd recommend putting the incumbent directly into the position. Um, is currently in the part-time position. Uh, so with that, I would ask if there's any questions or thoughts or anything on this, and I would certainly recommend you to approve the position and request to approve the position as well as the state branch. Thank you, Eric. Are there any questions from the board? Um, seeing that there are none, are there any comments or questions from the public? Stephen? Yeah, a uh, couple things. First of all, uh, we're kind of 
uh, doing reorganization, um, and it seems to me uh, to create a full-time position, uh, isn't, this isn't the, the time to do it. It's time to do it after we understand uh, how things are going to develop, maybe six, six months from now or whatever. Um, it has no reflection on uh, Carolyn, um, but uh, it's just, I think we need that flexibility. Second of all, um, uh, the position Eric was hired for, um, I, I, I realize he would like some more help, but it has survived for 20 odd years without that additional position, and I'm just wondering what additional responsibilities have come up where he feels like he needs the additional um, support. Um, and I, this is a bit uncomfortable, but uh, he is the highest paid person that we have, have had in that position. Um, and um, while he has great professional experience, not specifically in, uh, the kind of experience for the CSD director, uh, position and um, I, I don't know. We're paying. We're, it, it seems like we just reorganized and now we're adding more uh, fixed costs to to our bottom line. And I, I think uh, I think I urge prudence. So, uh, Eric, if, if you'd like to comment on that before you you do or anything, I would I would just like to note that since you had brought it up. It, during the, the hiring of the district manager, there was discussion around having additional support for the current position that we're looking for. So my understanding, this is consistent in terms of what has initially been going on. So, Eric, is there anything else to add? Okay, thank you. I'd like to add one thing. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, um, the district is looking at, well, is faced with, um, a migration to a new accounting system. Um, we may be doing this in multiple steps as opposed to a single one just simply because of timing. Um, there is intention and there will be effort going into um, going alone as an independent accounting system um, with appropriate security and process wrapped around that. Um, and not only during a migration, but also into the future and on an ongoing basis, there'll be uh, no new requirements for security that um, will require separation of responsibilities. Having a couple of people full time will aid that. And um, I do believe we're gonna be looking a lot closer at accounting information um, due to certain rules and regulations that are coming down the board than we ever have in the past. Um, on that basis, having an extra administrative employee on a full-time basis, I think, is called for. Ms. Um, thank you, Jeff, for pointing this out. I, um, that's actually something I would have brought up if, not, um, if you have done before. Um, a, did come from mergers, one reason. Um, um, the fact that, you know, it may not be an ideal case scenario where it would be one clean shot where hiring a, a temporary help would uh, be satisfactory. Um, having Carolyn here who knows uh, our district in and out um, assist us, um, not only in this one step, but, but potentially multiple steps, uh, integrating a new accounting system and also um, you know, going through chart accounts, cleaning up and seeing how that relates to our daily uh, uh, household is integral. A, B, um, historically, ever since I've been involved in the district, Carolyn has uh, volunteered more hours to the district than um, I, anyone I can think of. I mean, we are blessed with um, a team that works for us as hard as they do, um, putting together events and coming up with new ideas that generate revenue. Um, and they, um, you know, some of them are reimbursed uh, by 
being able to offset the hours somewhat. Uh, Carolyn was not able to for years and years. And um, <coughs> I think that it's um, only prudent that we um, actually clean up the shop and call it as it is. She has been working here full time. So before we continue with discussion on this, uh, I'll call at this time we would like to see if there is uh, a motion to approve uh, item I, personnel matters. Excuse me, you didn't ask for more comment from the public? Well, since it had moved into discussion, but you had not indicated that you wanted to make. You didn't tell us that it had switched back and forth. You're it supposed to tell with, us it that. It started with public comment, but if you have a comment, Linda, please go ahead. I do. Go ahead. I, and I hope that from now on you will tell us when certain things end and when certain things start. I believe that that's what Rosenberg's rules said you should do. Or maybe it's the bylaws. But in any, I ask for in any case. Public comment, please indicate. Yes, that. and then I raised my hand and Stephen raised his hand and I said to Stephen, go ahead. And okay. he said to me, go ahead. Okay. And Stephen went ahead and I didn't. So maybe you forgot that part. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to understand, this is a non-exempt position, which means she will get paid overtime. Is that what that means? Because if you're exempt, you get you no, do not get paid overtime. This states... It's it non-exempt, it would be qualified for overtime. So yes, it is, she will be getting paid overtime. What I just said. Perfect, wonderful. She needs it, she works a lot. I love Carolyn and what she works for. Okay. Is it a permanent position or only for six months or a year until the district manager can get up to speed and we can, you know, get things settled? Is it permanent? No, this is permanent. This has nothing to do, okay. This has nothing to do with me getting up to speed. This has more to do with the district as a whole getting up to speed and recognizing that you're a multi-jurisdictional, uh, five plus million dollar government agency that has been strumming along with one and a half administrative positions dedicated to it. it Thank you. Um, I don't want him to eat into my time. If, if you're counting my time, I don't want comments. I'm, I'm time. not, currently we do not have a, an amount of time set for agenda items. So, okay. Eric, if you- Thank you. No, I'm fine. Okay, so it's a, it's a full time position, it's not temporary. Okay, good. Um, the, the other question is that Marinwood has a very small staff, and I know that our fire chief handles a lot of stuff with the fire department. So with the park and recs having about 10 regular staff members, I was wondering why 20% of our permanent staff should be administrative uh, assistants. When I look at the county board of supervisors, they cover all of Marin County and each of the five supervisors has two administrative assistants and the number that the supervisors have to work with seems a lot bigger than what Marinwood district has to work with so I'm it just seems to me that the numbers are a little bit lopsided because Marinwood is so small and again kind of like Stephen I wonder why we are adding it now and why we can't handle it. It just seems like we did just downsize and now we're adding again. That's my comment. I, I, I can tell you that I, I get about half time with Carolyn. So she's done all just working with um, district manager or Shane. But, uh, she does plenty of stuff for the fire department when I, oh, good. When I go call them. Okay. Would staff like to respond? Yeah. Okay. Unless there's any further public comment on item I, uh, I'll ask for a uh, motion. Okay. Um, I'd like to move to approve the change in administrative position position from part-time to full-time. Is there a second? Second. Right. So is there any further discussion points from, from the board regarding this, this issue? You know, the one thing I would say is uh, I've designed this to become effective basically with the new fiscal year. 
uh, when I look at this, I realize I probably didn't put that in there. I think I communicated it last time and when such a conversation happened, but this would take effect ultimately July 1st or whatever that pay period is like that. So I'd, I'd like to add that, that frankly, I, I concur with my other colleagues on the board and, and myself am astounded at what this district has been able to do as Eric has, has stated with one and a half administrative staff. Um, you know, again, my understanding is that person in this current part-time position works far beyond what is, is expected and, and required of her at, at this time. And for me, I, I feel like it's, it's the, the amount of catch-up that we needed to do as a district more than justifies this. And I believe having had only one and a half in, in that capacity previously has has helped attribute to the need for the catch up. So in addition, um, <clears throat> past audit reports have pointed out the lack of separation of responsibilities and the lack of checks and balances <clears throat> that could be at least partially but not fully um, you know met by having a full time position um, along with Eric. Um, we've also talked in the past about oversight from a board member on some of those issues, but at least this gets us closer to those audit recommendations. So unless there's any further comment from the board, I'll call a motion to question. Um, all those in, in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. <coughs> and we'll I'll pass unanimously. Moving on to item J, fiscal matters. Um, J1, fiscal year 2015-16 budget amendment. <clears throat> Eric? Yeah, this uh, is a process that my understanding is has gone through, uh, you know, kind of several times when you create a budget, you know, literally 11 months ago, and you, you certainly cannot have a very clear crystal ball. Budget amendments are a fairly common and regular part of uh, finance within any business and usually they're made several times throughout a year. It's uh, uh, When I went through this, I obviously I sat down with uh, Chief Roach, I sat down with uh, Shane DeMarta and kind of looked at it myself. Carolyn and I went through some things as well. Um, every, you know, from a revenue expenditure side, as you can see, some of the primary areas are going to be taxes. This is what I'm anticipating. Uh, coming in based on December returns. I, I definitely feel confident and if anything maybe a little understated in terms of what actuals will be come June. Um, a lot of thought went into each of these. I could go through them, but I would probably rather just turn it over to you for questions. At the end of the day, total increase in anticipated revenue is exceeding the budget amendment that's going to be increased in expense. The reason we have to do an amendment is because we utilize the county as our accounting system of record. When you get to uh, a certain threshold, which would be 90% of a area, in this case services and supplies, they start sending you warnings. When you get to 100%, they put a hard stop on claims, meaning uh, you simply cannot cut a check, you cannot pay a bill uh, until you have a board approved budget amendment in here. Last year, I believe our amendment was somewhere around the area of about 250000 This year, we're down to 124000 So roughly half of the <coughs> expense side kind of going back into it. Um, as you look through, and you can see what the expenditures are, uh, as well as, uh, you know, what the revenue is. A lot of these, you know, we're matched up very, uh, Carefully, the main one obviously is going to be street light power. We've actually hit 100% of street light, that massive repair at the middle school that wasn't foreseen uh, with the underground lines really killed it. So right now, uh, mm -hmm. I cannot pay the power bill for the next power bill for street lights, so it's kind of a necessity there. Great. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Are there any questions from the board? Regarding the budget amendment? Yes, I'd like to no, just clarify. <clears throat> um, is this, in essence, uh, what I would term a forecast, i.e., as 
the picture becomes clearer. I mean, when you develop a budget, you're developing at the beginning of the year. As your business goes through, say, nine months now, mm -hmm. uh, fiscal year, your picture becomes a little bit clearer and you're able to forecast a more realistic. Yeah, that is actually a great way to state it. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it, we're three quarters, obviously, of the way through the year. We know where we're at, where we're going to fall. Um, you know, and speaking with both of the department heads, I think we're all very comfortable that this will comfortably carry us to the end of the year. I don't expect every, any of it to be spent, uh, but I think that uh, uh, we certainly need to look at it and adjust our budget accordingly. Very good. No further questions. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else from the board? Are there any comments or questions from the public? So this is this is a loan, basically. You're talking about. It. Am I understanding this correct? No, this is when, not a loan. This is anticipated revenue as well as anticipated expense. These aren't loan dollars. This is money that the district will earn on a revenue side. Uh, uh, okay, but it's not money that we have. Yeah. Currently. It's oh money. no! It's this. It's money that we have. It's. I mean, the money is in the bank account. I'm, I'm sorry. So is this? Is it just changing the budget number? It's a budget. That's all, that's all it is. Okay. It is strictly a budgeting exercise. Nothing else. I mean, the money is in the fund balance. I'm not saying we got need to go out and find this extra revenue. I'm saying this is revenue that is coming in or is already there. Right. So for the last number of fiscal years, we've been getting a loan from the county. During a very specific time of year, yes. That's a cash flow operation is the problem there. That is not necessarily a uh, end of year true up because the way our cash flow works, there's a period of time where the district has negative cash flow because a large portion on an annualized basis uh, comes from taxes and taxes don't get paid out until halfway through the year. Linda? Yes, thank you. Um, do corporations do this kind of stuff? I was wondering. Forecasting? No. Well, amendments. Uh, that's what forecasts are. Okay. They'll amend their budget when more information, so, clearer information okay. comes in. Because um, it just seems to me like fixing the books a little bit. But what I wanted to ask was <laughs> in the park department, um, the expenditures. <coughs> for the election expense and for legal expense was really increased a lot. Was that, that was that measure, right? Um, was it H or I? Uh, I think it measure I, okay. And? In part, the election expense, yes. Uh, not all of the legal expense, but a large portion of it. Thank you. And then I was wondering in the rec department was where the water and sewer has gone up over 400%. Do we have a problem with our water or sewer? Do we have a leak or the sewer was clogged or? They started billing us again. That's not <laughs> right. That I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. We, we weren't getting billed for it for a number of years and last year they fixed the meter finally so we finally got billed. <laughs> so that was a fixed meter? Yeah. For 400 percent, okay. Yeah, I think that was in a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we discussed it a few times. That was, that was okay, good. and then the last question I have in the rec department, um, can somebody explain the expense increase in adult program contracts, summer programs, and youth programs. I was just wondering if there was more people who were enrolled in these programs and more employees. Is that why the costs are higher? Right, so all those areas that you just mentioned would be offset by increased revenues in those programs. Right, I understand well. that. Yeah, so more popular <clears throat> for the youth programs, for example, we added like a Thanksgiving camp this year for the first time, so it's new programming and uh, additional participation. Okay, so you did have extra programs and more people going to them. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from the public on the budget amendment? Not on the amendment, no. Oh, okay. So no uh, that, that will be next then. Then at this time, I'd like to see if there is a uh, motion to approve on J1. I move to approve the fiscal budget amendment, fiscal year 15 budget amendment. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, are, is there any further discussion from the board? Mm -hmm. All right. Then all those in favor of uh, approving the motion? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Pretty unanimously. Right. Moving on to item J2, draft district budget for fiscal year 2016-17. Great. Um, well, I think you kind of have seen it in front. Uh, I kind of give you some of the highlights of some of those things that have changed. Um, and again, you know, this is subject, you know, uh, two weeks from tonight will be a public budget hearing, and then at next month's board meeting, we'll be putting it up for adoption. Um, obviously, uh, within the measure A, um, actually, if I kind of more go in order, uh, as you look, a, a, a few of the questions and some kind of official board direction that I am looking for is we have these uh, reserve and contingency goals. I know that they were spoken to last month. Um, I would certainly like to look for some direction here because if I'm just going to be kind of frank, uh, they're, you know, they're fairly hollow goals without any real teeth behind them besides it would be nice to. Um, so with that, uh, the, the board's desire to keep showing these as it is, I'm happy to do that. If eventually you think that there might be some other sort of uh, change proposed, then you know, we can certainly look at uh, what that is, uh, these were set a few years ago, I believe, during the sustainability study as uh, board goals uh, and targets. Do I, do I believe uh, Director Leo Climbing Green could probably give some insight as to why these numbers are what they are? Okay. So. Well, and my point being too that uh, you know, uh, as they are. I the, can give or, that. Yeah, because oh, okay. I was uh, working with uh, Director Hamlo on establishing these numbers. Okay. And uh, we actually did some research into best practices um, in, uh, you know, in the industries out there, not necessarily limiting ourselves to governmental agencies, but it, it, this was um, our uh, primary focus. And um, although based on the research, the numbers came up higher, um, this this was you know just kind of lowered to um, based based on the fact that there was not much money to go around. Yeah. Um, but you know as we can see, even even these numbers seem to be too high for our district at this point. Again, um, these numbers go back to best practices out there. And, um, Fund balance restoration was just uh, more of an arbitrary number um, because um, it was a step-by-step -step effort to um, re-establish our operating balance for the county. Yeah. Eric, in regards to unfunded liabilities reserve, if we know the percentage or number, and, and Jeff, maybe you might know this, if we at least know what number that is, to offset what things are growing by. I know that's a moving target, mm -hmm. but maybe that is more realistic or applicable in terms of at least for what we want to shoot for regarding unfunded liability reserve. Sure. Well, and I think, you know, Pepper changed the game on that to some degree in regards to the pension, uh, and I don't mean to step on Director Naylor's toes, but I, I think. You know, you're really kind of looking at your uh, other post-employment benefits, basically health uh, retirement benefits in that. Um, I mean, I can tell you right now, if your total is 342, and I think your annual required contribution on health alone towards the unfunded liability is somewhere in the nature of about 360,000. Is that right? 363. Well, see, I'm not close that was. Um, you know, that alone is more than this entire target. Yeah. Uh, you know, not to say that you set a goal of achieving that whole thing, but maybe you do. Maybe you set a goal of a, a percentage of that. I mean, that is pretty clearly laid out in the actuarial reports that the district has received that yeah. have been presented in these public meetings. Um, I, I, that's one I would certainly look at. My other recommendation would be uh, when you look at reserve for capital replacement, I would primarily focus on fire department needs for that. Um, because you do have Measure A funds that come in that, in that we have been using primarily for park and recreation needs as they are restricted towards. Yeah. Uh, and then your fund balance restoration is, is probably a good number. I guess my main point is, you know, what we have here are, you know, they're nice targets, they're nice goals to set, but they're, uh, when I say hollow, meaning you know, that's kind of all they are right now, as opposed to something more tangible and saying as a, you know, more of a policy standpoint from the board, uh, 
what are we really going to do here? Because I think as we've shown, uh, liabilities are only increasing and we're not truly starting to address those at this point in time. Um, that obviously can't happen tonight, but that might be a very um, poignant topic for the budget hearing yeah. uh, in the two weeks. So, and I think that's moving it in the right in the right direction. I think having the starting point that you had brought up, Director Perry, where you and Director Hansel created these out of best practice comparisons, I think is a great place to start. And now it would be great to see how it applies to us and, and try to get more applicable numbers. So right, right. Um, as you're, you know, kind of moving on through the budget past the cover page, and I'll get to measure A at the end. Um, I just, you know, wanted to give some quick updates on the actuals page here, just to make it clear. Uh, in total, property taxes received were at about 888,000. Uh, I'm anticipating 682,000 uh, remaining to come in on that. On special tax, I'm on just the second page, just kind of looking at the actuals part of it. On special taxes, uh, uh, about a little over 150 per park remaining to be received, a little over 440,000 for fire. Uh, when you total all of that up, just strictly in taxes, these aren't services or contracts, um, about 1.278 million remaining to come in on, on taxes that have not yet been received that will be received. Uh, Moving forward, in just to give that a little perspective on where we stand. Um, moving forward, I think, you know, part, uh, to Shane's credit, I mean, he's really kind of looked at this. We've looked at actuals. We've looked, you know, he's had a full uh, year in this role now. I've had a full year here and kind of seeing how things go. Um, obviously, any direction from the board will uh, certainly be applied. Um, but I, I really, I, I think it's pretty well thought out. I mean, it kind of is what it is. We've certainly done some raising in certain areas, uh, uh, primarily around maintenance, service needs, uh, looking at trees, so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, what was brought up earlier, kind of the water and the sewer. I, I'm not, I feel comfortable with this. It's, you know, it'd always be great to find more revenue and uh, lower expense. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how we would be able to do that at this point in time with this, uh, but I, I feel pretty good about it. I think it's a pretty, uh, it, it, we get a lot done with a little bit of resource in the park department. On the rec side, the one thing that's still missing here, and Shane and I need to sit down and kind of work on it, and we'll have it done before the budget hearing packet goes out, is uh, uh, really put, uh, factoring in cost and expense for, uh, or, Revenue and expense for the after-school program is not the change for the pilot next year on a small scale is not realized in this budget in any way, shape, or form. So revenue is going to go up, expense is going to go up, and I'd expect revenue to go up more than expense to go up. Otherwise, we wouldn't wouldn't do it. Um, but just to be clear, that is not in here, but it, it will be uh, within a couple weeks. We just really haven't had a chance to fully feel comfortable with the numbers to say, that's it, let's put it in. Uh, on the uh, fire side, you know, same deal. I mean, Chief and I have sat down, we've kind of looked through these. Uh, uh, not much, or if anything, really has changed um, since the last time you have seen this. Uh, you know, got uh, some levels of feedback from the fire commission that was uh, considered, some implemented. Um, one thing, uh, and kind of segueing in with Keen's presentation earlier. Um, street lighting is incredibly easy to exceed what is dedicated for street lighting. And right now it's a $15 per parcel charge that I think has been in there for 20 years since it has been raised. Uh, I don't know if at some point that might be considered, um, but you know, you have one major repair and you've just gone right through your street light budget. Um, if you have no major repairs, you have a little bit left over to go into a contingency fund. Well, we cleared out that contingency fund this year and still don't have enough that's in there. Um, so that would be something certainly for the board to discuss uh, at a future meeting, um, just looking at that, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, we have other revenue and other tax revenue that can be applied here, but the 
practice has always been revenue for street lighting has always been through the $15 uh, per parcel assessment. And, is it, and so there's no cost escalator associated with that? No. Okay. No, it's flat. Okay. It's flat. And these are conversations I still want to have further with Marine General Services Authority. I'm going, I plan to learn what are other uh, jurisdictions, assessment levels, uh, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see what LAFCO then kind of comes back. I know Keen and I have kind of talked about how come street lights are controlled by all these separate county level entities. Uh, the cities make a little bit more sense, but when you're in an unincorporated area, um, so I'll be curious to see what comes back with that. Uh, and then just a really quick update on Measure A. I think I told you last time, I, I did put in, we have received an estimate from the county. They are anticipating 80900 in revenue available in the fiscal year to spend. Uh, we typically get half of that exact number um, in July, very quickly into the beginning of the fiscal year. And then we get uh, the other half once it's actually been actualized uh, based on sales tax revenue in December. Um, assuming that it, I've got all my reports and everything that is required submitted to them and approved. Um, they have always given us conservative estimates that have always been exceeded uh, usually by 10% or greater. So I don't know if they're looking at, okay, we've undershot every time or if they're still being conservative that this number will go up. Either way, this number is almost 15,000 higher than any other estimate they've ever provided for Measure A for our district. Um, so that you know, right now in our Measure A fund, we have approximately $65,000 sitting in the fund. Um, we are still have the kitchen project that we would like to get done that has proven to be much more challenging than we anticipated, much more costly. Uh, Shane and uh, the park guys have really spent a lot of time kind of looking and thinking about that. I think it'll probably have to come together in pieces and most of it is going to wind up being done internally. And uh, we're not talking about a, a gut studs to sub jaws here. We're talking about, you know, putting in new laminate countertops and uh, prefab uh, shelves or prefab cabinets and everything else. So when you factor that in, that was originally approved as a $20,000 Measure A project. I, I still think we could keep it under that level, uh, given what we're kind of envisioning with it, which would leave you with about 45,000 in carryover heading into the year, plus the 80,000 coming in. So total available for 16, 17 would be about $125,000. Uh, you don't have to spend it all, but it's there. Uh, I believe this ends in like 2020, so it's all got to be spent by that period of time. You are allowed to cover carryover. Uh, plus, I would assume that there's a meager uh, level of interest that has accrued to this account as well. Uh, and when I say meager, That's the county. Seven and a half percent. Well, not at the, count, the county, it's not earning seven and a half percent. Uh, it's trapped in a county fund, but it is. Uh, all the same, I, I, I'm very comfortable saying that there'd be 125,000 available for 1617 uh, park indoor recreation expenses. Uh, Measure A is absolutely going to be on the budget or on the agenda for the upcoming recreation uh, park and rec commission meeting, uh, where they'll kind of go through and weigh in. I, I believe we probably earmarked one very large project for uh, 1617 that will pretty much obliterate all of the Measure A funds uh, available to us um, when you look at it. Uh, hopefully not all of them, but uh, I would say more like eighty to 100,000 of them with maybe about 25,000 uh, still sitting there for it. Too. So it's, it's a nice not, resource to have. And it's not a butterfly garden, right? No. No. Uh, you know, so that's kind of the quick... Um, Many of these things do remain the same, much to the point that was brought up. Uh, I do literally go through this on the summary notes and try to pay attention to the actuals. I know those are kind of two different exercises looking at the current year actual versus next year budget, but that's what the following page is. Um, questions? Comments? Feedback? Direction? I have a question. Great. <clears> Through <throat> the paid bills, we're each month we're paying the unfunded liabilities. That's or PERS. 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 That's, yes. That's PERS. Mm -hmm. Where does that fall into? Under PERS. The budget, separated by? By, by department. Because uh, each department actually has different rates and different unfunded, uh, different right. classifications of employee. It's at the top. It's under it's up in each department. It's 5130510. Uh, okay, PERS. So that's where it comes from. Okay, and it's, it 
It's only going up. It ain't going down, though. Ten percent for the sixteen, seventeen. Uh, a larger jump. No, ten percent sounds about accurate, but ten percent is a pretty big jump. Especially when some numbers are larger than others. Yeah, true. Okay, thanks. Eric, the <coughs> change in position that we uh, just previously talked about, has that, that hasn't been factored into? That is reflected in the budget you're looking at. It oh, is. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So that won't change these numbers presented at all. So the exercise that we went through just a while ago in which we recognize that what we're dealing with right now is a budget and it's our best guess of what's going to be spent and earned over the next year and it's likely to be imperfect. At some point in time, we will probably go through the same exercise that we just went through and said, ah, with better information, we now know what our picture is going to be. I would, I would assume. Having said that, um, I believe that we need to consider with regard to our reserves, and I can touch on this if you want in my uh, unfunded liability report, but since we're on the budget right now, I think we need to all as a board consider um, <clears throat> using whatever funds are available without incurring undue risk to put in an irrevocable trust to help um, diminish the OPEB liability. Um, Foregoing seven and a half percent expense on that liability every year um, is a much better deal for the district going forward than um, OG is We're going to get a you know a one percent hit or a half a percent hit from borrowing money from the county. So um, again, if we do this over time and we start to pay down um, that that liability, even if we can't. Um, pay down the amount that will prevent the liability from growing. Um, we have, number one, diminished it. Um, we will forego 7.5% on whatever we can put aside. We do kiss that money goodbye. It's gone. Okay? That's gone into that re retirement account. But it will save us money over time. And if I understand the actuarial report that we just walked through together, um, so doing will allow us to change the discount rate at which those liabilities are um, calculated mm -hmm. from four to five percent, which will reduce the overall liability. Which will improve your balance sheet. That's correct. Yes, that's my understanding as well. So that's something I think we need to consider. We need to consider at what level we will do that without incurring risk. I, that's why I specifically brought that point up. Thank you. Good. So great minds think alike. I, I have my little post-it here. Um, I definitely think we have to start showing it in the budget the same way we will be forced to show it in our statements. Um, sooner than later will help us really to adjust and align. Um, again, these um, numbers were kind of based on the research that we did, but it's um, at this point I think as we are getting more information from you, Jeff, about the OPEB, I, I really think this is where the critical um, <coughs> chasm is and uh, needs to be addressed. Um, I would recommend that um, um, rather than setting a certain random percentage, um, we, um, if possible, um, decide that any um, positive numbers, have any um, excess of, rep of uh, revenues over expenditures will be um, um, set aside in, s in one shape or another. Um, I don't know if um, setting just a separate account is enough, uh, restricted account, or whether we have to do a revocable trust. I, I in, in order to stop, in order to reduce the percentage that will be charged in interest, it has to go into an irrevocable trust. 
And then the question, of course, is um, you know what will be the return on investment that we'll actually earn there? Understood. Um, do we have the earning power as as We've a We've got some investigation today. Right. You bet. Understood. So that's um, that's one comment I have, and that's the most expensive, most uh, important one. That basically any money we see that we'll have coming in, we put aside. Can I, before you move on to your next comment, just yeah. respond really quickly, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't disagree with any of those comments. I don't think we're going to have that information or any of that figured out within a month from today when this needs to be adopted. Um, in terms of you know kind of trust amounts or anything, I think certainly as things come to light and more information is brought into these sessions regarding irrevocable, irrevocable trust options, how much to open it with and start it with, uh, you can always amend a budget at that point in time. I also think in regards to having, you know, I, I completely agree with you in that our budget is certainly missing a lot of categories. Uh, in terms of accruals and everything, I think right now, since we're still kind of in a state of flux with our accounting system, I, again, I just want to be set the expectation that I don't see us being there with that by the time this budget has to be approved. Um, I mean, right now, we're not even 100% clear which accounting system we're going with, what of our chart of accounts looks like, so on and so forth. So by May, we need to have a budget approved uh, to be able to present to the county, who is our bank, and be able to, on July 1st, continue to make sure people receive paychecks and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I don't disagree at all with any of them. I'm just trying to put realistic expectation that it can be accomplished within the time period that a budget actually has to be adopted. Uh, but I agree, balance sheets and budgets, and I mean, these things, you know, budget, this is an operating budget uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of the balance sheets that you're referring to, which our next system will be able to much more clearly print and present. If that makes sense. And by 2017, it will be legally required. Yeah. Um, so then the second comment is, um, um, am I correct to assume that if we were to finally address the um, uh, parks shed, maintenance shed that will be coming from the measure A funds? Uh, I believe that's going to be my recommendation. Obviously, again, I, the process has been to run this kind of through the Park and Rec Commission, go through there right now. That's the direction that my head is most certainly in. I don't know how you're going to afford to address it otherwise. Right. No, because in terms of like <coughs> cleaning up stuff that has been out uh, there that needs that to is be capital in order, the same replaced. way Carolyn finally can, you know, get paid for the hours that she's been working. Um, we really have to make sure that we don't injure our workers while they work there. Did you have any other? No, comments? sorry, thank no, you, no, that's No all. problem. Um, Jeff, I, I wanted to ask, so regarding your suggestion of an irrevocable trust, um, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming you don't necessarily have a number or target in, in mind necessarily, right? Like that's part of the, what you believe we need to discuss and, and try to land on. Yes, right. I do. Okay. Um, you know, I think, again, when we're, when we're dealing with a budget a year in advance, um, we're estimating, yeah. you know, what we're going to have available. Things will change as we get closer to the end of the year. Um, there's nothing I can think of right now that dictates that we'd have to make a, you know, particular payment at the beginning of the year. We could sort of make payments as we go along, but I think just simply the demonstration that we are paying down the account has a lot of positive value for this district. Absolutely. In terms of the discount rate, in terms of reducing the liability that we're paying 7.5% interest on, um, you know, we can be conservative. But, um, you know, right now, if we were to try and keep the liability level, we would have to put $363,000 in an account that we do not have. Yeah. So it's going to be some partial payment, yeah. that, but still. That's OPEP, right? That's OPEP, yeah, because we are already paying right. down the pension expense on the um, right. annual required contribution. 
And Eric, I just, I just want to confirm, for his, if we as a district were to do that, that doesn't restrict us from needing to borrow from the county during that short period, necessarily, correct? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bill, did you have any <coughs> things? Yeah. No, that was... <laughs> <clears throat> it's nice it's brought up out in the open now. Yeah. Right. Um, Part of the budget process where it needs to be. Are there any comments or questions from the public, Ron? Yes, I've noted uh, an arithmetic anomaly in the fire department budget, page FD3. The bottom shows total fire budget up 4%. Yet it shows CSA 13 contract up 5.4%. That's a mathematical impossibility. I request to be corrected if the CSA 13 contribution not go up any more than the total budget increase for the fire department. Well, Ron, I would uh, I appreciate your comment, and as you and I have had this conversation several times in the past, uh, I'm happy to answer it again in public here, in that uh, that number for CSA 13, for starters, is strictly a placeholder. Uh, if you will look at last year's budget that says 599000 when it was said and done, it was actually turned into $561,000 because of all the end-of-year true-ups that happened. Uh, because it is based on a budget and trued up on actual expenditures on the end, uh, so on and so forth. And because of the way the math works in this, with your budget being 26.02% of the total, it will never go up in the same number because that would be a mathematical anomaly. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I we'll, raise the we'll, fire budget, we'll it changes things. We'll iron it out in the end, but I just want you to know. I really do read this stuff. Oh, Ron, I know you do. You know the old adage, right? No good deed goes unpunished. Goes unpunished. Absolutely. Completely in local government. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Are there any other comments or questions from the public? And they are not, and unless there are any other further questions from the board. Oh, I, I have one quick comment. Go ahead. I'm going to, uh, first of all, it goes into, um, into our liability, and it continues to grow. Um, why? We're not paying anything against that. That's, that becomes part of this unfunded liability in the future. So um, <clears throat> that is the first shoe to drop. GASB 45 and the implicit, the implicit subsidy that is now um, growing and being charged at 7.5% interest a year. Uh, GASB 40, or I'm sorry, 74 and 75 are simply the next two salvos from the Government um, Accounting Standards Board, which will again uh, put more stringency in place with regard to these future health care benefits. Um, 74 will go in next year and will simply uh, make the financial statement notes of what that liability is much clearer and much better publicized. Why they go through this step, I don't know, because the very following year they will say, well, that's not enough. We're going to put these liabilities on your balance sheet and they can publish them. Okay? So, for all intents and purposes, that's what we can expect by fiscal year 2017. And um, the other thing that um, Doug was helpful in was helping us understand what we needed to do um, in terms of addressing this um, issue so it wouldn't grow phenomenally. Because if we do nothing at this point in time, OPEB liability will exceed the pension liability. Okay, that will happen by next year. So doing nothing costs us. Doing nothing puts um, all retirement benefits in the future in jeopardy. So we need to do something about this, um, and we need to do it now. Again, I said earlier when we were talking um, about the budget that just by fact of making some sort of payments into an irrevocable trust um, shows that we're trying to address this issue, even if we don't do it to the point 
where we stop the bleeding, okay, um, we can indeed start to uh, discount that future cash flow by a, um, a different rate that will reduce the liability. So, uh, unfortunately, at this point, we haven't done a, you know, any payments whatsoever. Um, Eric and I, and I have talked briefly about um, investigating certain agencies that we might be able to um, work with and determine um, you know, what our best possibility would be for putting some of those funds aside. And um, that will be a step that we're going to start to address shortly. And that's pretty much it. Um, oh, otherwise, <clears throat> um, some of the information that was gained on the OPEC side to complement what we've already talked about on the pension side um, will be provided to our negotiating team um, for a presentation shortly. And that is it. Are there any questions? Anything more? No. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Jessica. Sure. Uh, are there any comments or questions from the public? There are none. Bill, is there anything you'd like to add to that as part of the committee? As part of the committee? <laughs> I was missing. <laughs> I, know you're, I know you're a little and this month. In, inundated with taxes right now. Just work. All right. Uh, again, thank you, Jeff, for continuing to work on that and uh, do that work for the district. <laughs>
We'd be going with a well-known commercial manufacturer. Okay. So you're saying expected life is four to six years. Is there a warranty? You get a warranty for two years, uh -huh. which is average. You get one or two years. That's kind of how it goes with the pool industry. Okay. Understood. You know, you know, it's unfortunate having to buy equipment at any point, but from a financial standpoint, um, it just <laughs> makes more sense uh, to, to stick with sell. Right, because after after a year, we would spend more in liquid chlorine than the cost for replacing the cell. Right, just transporting that on liquid chlorine on a weekly basis and time spent. Yeah. Is this um, covered in the adjustments that were made for the budget, or is this going to be incremental? <laughs> no, actually, it was a very uh, specific line item. However, not both of these. Um, so if you wanted to go with the salt generator as well as the ozone all at one time, uh, which ultimately is what I would recommend, then I would also recommend that uh, we take some of the excess that currently exists. Well, not excess. We take some of the funds that currently exist within Measure A. I submit something to uh, the county that says uh, we are revising our work plan and ask them to approve us to purchase this piece of equipment. I do not anticipate any level of uh, opposition from the county to that and putting it into this this year. Uh, the funds are certainly within, mm -hmm. within that fund to do it. And then I would move forward with the ozone within the budget that was certainly included in the amendment. That would be my ultimate. Personally, in talking to Shane and having a pool, uh, that would be my recommendation. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a reason pools start by digging a giant hole in the ground. There. Throw money in. That's exactly right. <laughs> oh, no, if you buy a boat. <laughs> we push the boat into the hole. Uh, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, it's just kind of aging equipment that's in there. I think at this point, uh, you know, I'm talking with Shane, I'm talking with the pool people, uh, you know, that thing has really been, the, it, it'll be almost a brand new setup back there now uh, in terms of machinery. Mm -hmm. And just note, last year, <clears throat> you know, when I started a few years back, uh, a lot more than a few years at this point. At the pool, we used to lose about $40,000 a year. Last year, we actually made a small, I hesitate to say profit, because you know, you're putting money aside for future. But I mean, the pool didn't lose money last year. Mm, that's, that's amazing. Which is a feat. <laughs> a feat in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, I think just in looking at the numbers that Shane put together, if you, if you don't do this, you're looking at five digits worth of chlorine purchases well, this year alone. And we'll have to do it at some point. And so you're, uh, you're exactly right. This is a pretty critical piece of equipment. So um, in the meantime, and to do this work, will it affect the operation of the pool at all? No. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't shut down. OK. Understood. This is the beginning of the pool season. Yeah. So yeah. are there any other questions from the board? Are there any comments from the public? Oh, I'm sorry. Go Are you just talking about you talking about all park stuff? No, we're just we're for, we're just dealing with item M three right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. all right. So, I'd like to move no for a motion. Is there a second? Second. Can I ask if that that gets clarified where you want how you want to do this? Oh. Uh, meaning is it's going to come through? Uh, you want me to submit a. Uh, request to utilize measure eight funds for this or not would be pretty much the easiest way of paying <coughs> for something that we didn't budget for well, i think it's, and we I think it's the most budgets. affordable way i don't think it hurts us too bad at measure eight i still think just some of the long-term plans that were discussed <coughs> with measure eight earlier we're still in a position to be able to do that all right because you said it after this fiscal period we're going to have around 40 45 thousand left um, it's already allocated. <laughs> uh, no. Um, <laughs> Can I make a clarifying motion? Please. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we um, authorize the purchase of the salt water generator for the pool and uh, apply for measure A funds in order to um, pay for them. Thank you. I'll there. second that. All right. So. Motion has now become <clears throat> been made by 
Yes. Director Inhaler. So that was just for the so, so I do want to, we, we, do, we don't need, at this point, we don't need to <coughs> reapprove the ozone generator. You've already approved it. You would need to, uh, be, to, we have not moved on that yet. Yeah. It's been approved. You would basically need to say, let's not do this right now, okay. which is an option. Okay. I don't think that is, that's not something that I would recommend doing um, if there's any other position from any board member. Mm -hmm. No, I think we leave that alone. Yeah, I agree. <coughs> right. Um, so unless there's any further discussion from the board, I'll call the question of order. All those in favor? Um, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Uh, moving on to item N2, resolution 2016-01. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I, you know, I tried to give you guys a pretty uh, detailed memo on what's going on here and why we have to do this. I certainly looked into various options, talked, you know, sent it out through uh, other districts, see who they're using, and at the end of the day, a company who we use for a lot of things. Uh, to my surprise, actually offers this as part of their ancillary coverages, um, and it turned out to be one of the best coverages. It is substantially similar to what we already have, um, yet uh, quite a bit less expensive in cost. So at the end of the day, this is going to save us some money while providing a substantially similar benefit. Great. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, but just because it's through SDRMA, you have to do the whole resolution and everything that was attached. So, and for the record, I'll through uh, resolution 2016-01 is approving the form of and authorizing the execution of a memorandum of understanding and authorizing participation in the special district risk management authorities health benefits program. Are there any clarifying questions from the board? Will this have any effect on OPEP? No. His wife, yeah. Yeah, his wife, wife and, and, uh, and uh, AD. Um, I just want to, um, once again, at, um, in public, ask the question I asked before, and that is, um, will this require in any way, shape, or form meet and confer with the employee group? I, I don't believe so. I've looked at... Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I've looked at the MLU. There are currently three members of the employee group who actually participate in the district life. Uh, the other seven participate in the option they have through their MOU, which is AFLAC. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, <coughs> it definitely states the life insurance policy provided by the district, which in turn would be uh, AIG, which is who is the group that is basically discontinued. I mean, that's just keeping with them is, is simply not an option. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, again, think it is substantial. It would probably be a very good question uh, to seek a little bit more feedback on. I'm happy to do that. I think that is a good question. I do not believe it does, but I'm not going to say it and tell you 100% that I don't. That it, that I, I would be not. surprised if this required meet and confer other than just meet and inform that, hey, this is the district provided life insurance option. You can do this or you can do AFLAC. You pick. They have the choice to They have the choice. You're, exactly. you're giving them the benefit that you provide. Um, okay. Yeah. And I, again, I don't think it's a meet and confer. I think you just let them inform, hey, the district life insurance option has changed to this. Well, and each person is going to have to individually enroll in this right. as well. Understood. So uh, at which point they would certainly have the option to choose to go the AFLAC route as well. All right. I just don't opt to. No, I, I think it's, it, is a, it is a smart. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, please, yeah, please make sure to, what you will do, obviously, do, you know, make, make sure that they know that it's changing because it's just not a panel. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, mm -hmm. uh, all right. Yeah, so, are there any other further clarifying questions from the board? Are there any questions or comments from the public? All right, then. Uh, I'd like to see if there's a motion for approving item N2, resolution 2016-01. I move to approve. Is there a second? I'll second that. Right. <coughs> Are there any further discussion points or items on, on this from the board? None. 
then um, I'd like to bring a motion to uh, call a question of order. All those in favor of approving <coughs> resolution that resolution 2016-01. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, motion passed unanimously. Eric, is there anything else of urgent <coughs> need that we need to cover at this board meeting? No. All right. Then um, we will adjourn at this time. Thank you.